Welcome back to the show. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks. We are coming to you very late at night, our time. Dara, I think it's 2 a.m., it's 3 a.m. here in Malta. You're just off the back of a, a bad beat story, maybe, or a, or at least a deep run, not deep enough. Yeah, I don't think getting your eights cracked by Kings qualifies as a bad beat, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was a standard get in. Yeah, d- deepest run in uh, in the uh, WPT thirty three dollar thing. So like eight thousand runners down to the last eighty. But yeah, all the money was up top. So it is are. what it is. Yeah. Well, I am delighted to say that we are joined, and this is the reason that we're doing this so late night because it's a very special guest. It's a two time GPI Global Poker Award winner. He has the media content video crown. He has Great. the journalist of the year, a very prestigious crown. I can't help but notice he doesn't have a podcast crown, but I'm sure there's one in the pipeline. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the lock-in, Joey Ingram. Wait, are you trolling me? <laughs> yeah. Can we troll you? Is that possible? Are you possible? trolling me? I don't mind. I like, I like getting trolled. I like getting trolled. No, I, I think... Uh, it's much better than podcast anyway. Well, technically, I've won podcast of the year award before, but I do understand what you're saying. Global. And... Global. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't really, those awards, I think about those awards uh, a little bit, right? Because it's not many of us kind of com- competing for those awards. And usually it's like the people that, that know you or that your name's kind of buzzing or anything like that. So I don't know how those, you know, I think we think those awards are real great acknowledgement of <laughs> kind of the work that we've done. So I know that we kind of appreciate them, but I'm not sure how much people outside of that really. <laughs> yeah, nobody else cares. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I remember speaking to, uh, to 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 one of the nominees for the podcast award after he, he didn't win, and I said, "Unlucky," and he he's he had never he didn't even realize he was nominated, <laughs> and oh, really? uh, he was like, "What are the GPI awards? I've never heard of those." Yeah, I mean, I think like awards are our belief system in some ways where if you believe they matter to you, then they matter. And mm. if others people believe they matter, then then they do, right? Some awards are able to create that sort of prestige and that brand around their awards. But GPI, I mean, they don't really have a strong brand anyway to begin with in the poker world. So people aren't going to care if GPI is going to give out awards. Like we only see them once a year. So if it was like the Poker Stars Awards maybe or the Party Poker Awards, then it might actually mean something to more people. But when it's a company like that giving them out, so it's not to say the awards don't matter and they aren't some sort of like way to, to decide who's good or who's bad or who's who you listen to or who's whatever. It's like a good benchmark to potentially look up against. But I think it's just uh, the company doing it right might not have that connection with the poker audience and the casual audience. Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. And I have to say, actually, when Darren and I entered the podcast market, which is about five years ago now, it, there was only you and maybe two or three others, Andrew Brokos and Thinking Poker. And I, I'm poker actually guys as well, I think we're right. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess you forged the way in many ways, Joey, so fair play. You are a bit of a one-man hype train, it's got to be said. The last episode of The Lock-In that we had featured our great friend Henry Kilban, and I couldn't help but Mm. notice during the week you and Henry interacting, he said that you're going to concoct some sort of uh, PLO vlogs while doing edibles streams is that is there any well, that's truth- an idea he had listen man I don't know listen he's a young GTO commentator he's coming up he's trying to learn his way he's trying to figure out if he wants to be a uh, broadcaster or a poker player you know what the hell he wants to be it seems like to me maybe he's got maybe so I said oh, he, yeah I just talked to the kid I like the kid a lot he loves PLO he proposed this idea I do it anyway so why not let's get after it right like we'll have a PLO plus edible session I'll work them over pretty hard. I got more experience playing PLO and edibles, so it'll uh, it'll be nice. I can't wait. I'm excited. Good stuff, Dara. I noticed you're doing very well in our own Uni Best Summer Circuit Series event. I'm just curious: uh, is there any drug um, inclusion there? Is there any uh, maybe enhancement going on? I think it depends on your definition of drugs. <clears throat> when I was a distance runner, I wasn't even allowed to drink caffeine because that was actually on the banned list. So I would definitely fail a running test right now, just based on the amount of coffee I've been drinking. Apart from that, it's it, it's all been done clean, I have to say. It's one of the interesting things. There's such a contrast in the attitudes of the poker world compared to the running world. In the running world, like anybody who takes anything is persona non grata, so nobody ever wants to speak to them again, but a uh, bit different in the poker world. Wow. Yeah, yeah, just a cursory glance over a parking lot outside a poker room would uh, reveal uh, quite a bit going on. But anyway, enough of that. Uh, I do want to get immediately, Joey, uh, to your interview last week with Doug Polk, your great friend. Sure. Obviously, he is in the process of sort of going back to school. He's re-educating himself in the world of, of, of high stakes, heads up 
poker because he has this enormous game now coming up maybe October time against Daniel Negreanu. I couldn't help but notice in your interview with him, and you guys have done so many interviews, some of your mm. best content have been interviews together. It, it did feel like he was more subdued and a bit distracted. Uh, he kept referring to, I, I got to fill this truck up, Joey. I got I to gotta put all the money in the truck. And it was almost like begrudging you the time that he could be filling even more into that truck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was pretty funny. You know, I've known Doug for so long. He's probably one of the people I've known the, the most in poker. We met like maybe 2008 or 2009. I think it was like 2008 in December because we knew each other from 2 Plus 2, the poker forums. He did a crazy bet in 2007 at 10 cent, 25 cent, which inspired a crazy bet I did in 2008 at those same stakes for, I think actually it was, it was, it was the three stakes. It was 25 cent, 50 cent, 50 cent dollar, 10 cent, 25 cent, right? I played the 600,000 hands. And Doug, I forgot about this. Doug was actually staking me for 50 cent dollar during that prop bet challenge that I did. So I've known him for a very long time. And we have a pretty good relationship. Like we've kind of seen each other go from smaller stakes to high stakes to doing content to kind of improving at content, getting better at content. So I've seen him at all different points of time in his life, but I've never really seen him like this before, you know, where he's like quiet and kind of like focused on backing up the truck. He's kind of struggling with poker right now because he's been trying to learn it again. So he's in a very different state of his life where he never expected to actually have to play poker again. And now he's like got to study, as he's saying, like 13 hours a day. I think he's just kind of really fucking annoyed that he has to do that whether right like that's just what's required to win this bet and obviously he wants to crush Degrano. these two have like some sort of bitter feud I mean they maybe this is like the, the the closing match of that feud right four or five years it builds up and now they're two lions in the jungle right coming after each other and I think that's that's what he feels that pressure a little bit because he's like now he's like oh I don't I'm not good right now it's gonna take me a while to get better he just realizes how much work he has out of him I think yeah, he really seemed like he was all business. And I suppose, uh, I, you know, it's all sort of happened by mistake, hasn't it? Like he, he sort of called Daniel out thinking there was no chance Daniel would ever accept. And then he did. And he's like, oh, shit. And now it's an opportunity because obviously Doug has that incredible resume when it comes to heads of poker. It's a great opportunity to win maybe a million bucks. I remember people joking like a million bucks isn't going to change either of their lives. I don't know how rich Doug is, but I imagine a million bucks would be quite nice. Yeah, I mean, I think he's he's a businessman, right? So if he sees, all right, if I put in work for two months here and my potential return is going to be $500,000 to a million dollars and also I get to bash this guy that I don't like and in the process maybe sell some more poker business and also maybe make a course out of that, crushing Daniel Negreanu heads up how I did it. So there's a lot of potential opportunity that not only comes from getting better here. So you could say it like, okay, well, if I'm spending all this time on poker, I'm taking away from other businesses. Well, he's not... I don't see him as very passionate about a lot of their business right now anyway. So maybe through this process, he finds other opportunity. And if at the worst, he makes himself a good return on his time and he gets to crush someone that he really wants to crush. So I see a couple positives out of there for him. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I, I did enjoy your news content around Nekrenu. You seem sort of begrudging to do it. You didn't really want to cover him. You, you don't like to cover him. You think it's all a bit silly. All the teeth anus business got all a bit sort of nonsensey and you made the very I thought uh, discern point that it all had a feeling of like he was a wrestler turning into the bad guy wrestler and it was all a bit ridiculous and then this week I was listening to Lance Bradley on the Fives podcast and he made the same wrestling reference where he was like well which of them is the heel and which of them is the face I think the face is the good guy the hero and the heel is the villain. And obviously you can still like the heel as would be the way the storytelling goes in, in wrestling. Dara, turning to you, like, I obviously we have our run in with Daniel going back a while. We, we always sort of made our points on pretty principled grounds. It did get a little mucky uh, a couple of times between us. So I'm guessing you might see him as the heel. Is Doug also a heel? <laughs> No, I don't think it'll come as any surprise to anybody uh, that I'm very much on Team Doug on this. Um, I, I think Doug's been hugely positive for poker in general. Um, last few years, uh, his break, his hand breakdown videos were pretty much game changing, and they're and they're, and they're so much copied now. And they were so good at communicating the game to recreations at a time when it seemed like it was very difficult to do that. So I think. Uh, Doug has been tremendously positive for poker. I mean, obviously, Daniel was back in the day too, but I think since Doug's star has risen, Daniel has gone the other way and is 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 now, if anything, a 
uh, I would say, he's, he, well, he's a liability for poker in a sense. It's interesting when it comes down to this because I think there's a generational thing as well. A lot of older players, my gener- gener- generation, let's say, who play exclusively on, sorry, who play exclusively live, they still kind of see Negreanu the way they've always seen him. So he's sort of like the the, the hero. And Doug is this young upstart Um some people are, have even suggested that they've never heard of Doug Pogue, which I find very difficult to believe. Then when you move to the online generation, and despite my age, this is the generation I see myself as part of, uh, Doug is very much a hero and Dean Eggs is very much a villain um, for his role in the whole Poker Stars and Maya thing and, 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 and other bits and pieces. So yeah, I don't think it's particularly close in this. I think um, you will see pretty much everybody from our background, let's say, um, mm. is going to be rooting for Doug on this. Yeah, I want to bring it back to Joey now in a second, because you, you would have a great perspective on this. But uh, I suppose from my point of view, when it comes to content creation, Doug's idea was to do hand breakdowns. And he always had a sort of a wink and a smile when he'd be taking the piss out of someone. And that was a really nice vehicle for really high quality information, which we all learned from. I remember picking up those videos, not really knowing much about Doug and immediately thinking, God, these are an amazing resource. Having said that, the parody and the sort of piss taking did accelerate or it did amplify a little. And, and obviously Doug has a brilliant team around him with Thomas and Jamie who have always been able to arm him with a really razor sharp wish, if you like, to go along with his own fantastic performances in that role and his own contributions, I'm sure, to the, the writing and production. So in a way... Like it's fair game. Everything Doug has ever done is is kind of like a satire show, and he's very rightly satirizing the most easily satirizable person in poker, who has time and time again sort of let us down. And he's he's almost doing it at the moment as well with a new company. He's letting us down as an ambassador for players. He's being a shill for his paymasters. Yeah, I mean, hundred percent, right? I mean, I think what both you guys said really, really nice, nice take on that situation. You guys. I can tell you understand at a very higher level than most people that I speak to and conversate with about these kind of things and people I deal with on Twitter and two plus two sometimes. So I appreciate you guys at least paying that much attention to have that perspective and kind of see what I see too, right? I see this guy who, who was like the hero to our generation when we first started playing online poker, like Dan Negron is one of the biggest guys. He was always like being a good personality, putting on a show, trying to read people's hands. He's like a great player. He's a big ambassador for poker. And then as I started getting into content and then as Doug started getting into content, right. As I still thought like, Oh, this is like the guy you want to have on. It's like the biggest guy. But then I, when I started seeing kind of the things poker stars was doing the players. And then this guy was just like, not speaking out. I'm like, what this guy's fucking problem here, man? Like what, what, what is going like, And then I remember I had him on my show that one time and I go, listen, bro, I don't understand what the fuck you're saying right now. Cause I don't agree with anything you're saying. Cause you're total on the side of the site. And I've had in my mind that you were for the players that I can't argue with you right now because you just have more information than me. You understand the business better. You understand the specifics better. I can't put up a fight here. I can't make a good argument against these kind of things and why you're advocating for all these terrible changes for the players. So I said, all right, I got to study a few years. I got to get in the lab to understand what, what this guy's talking about. And now I just see that he is full for the companies, right? And that's fine because that's how some people are and that's how they that's how they make their living. That's how he makes money. He builds relationships with the companies and he tell, says what the companies want them to say. That's the role he's taken on. That's what he does. So yeah, he's just not thinking about things from the professional player perspective or even like empathizing with them, trying to give a fuck at all about them. So I've just started getting over time. Like, well, if this dude doesn't care about us and like, you know, got his own thing and he's trying to pretend he's like this, whatever. Like I've sort of said my piece in the situation. So I just kind of stopped paying attention to the guy, man. You know, you want him to to promote poker and it's always good to have positive personalities and powerful personalities who are well known to help spread the game as ambassadors. But I mean, I think people look at him now, you know, some people find it funny. I'm like reading some comments. I go check to see how he's doing sometimes. And there's people tuning in because he's just got a big name that was built up by all these past channels and all this marketing dollars that poker stars threw at this situation. So essentially poker stars ESPN built him to be what he is. And he's just living off of that. For a while, he doesn't do any good strategy. There's not like anything really that stands out about his attempt to retain this attention level on him, except make really loud polarizing statements on Twitter, 
post some polarizing things occasionally on social media with him and his wife, and then continue to do the YouTube content, which he already has a big name and a big audience. So it's not hard to maintain that because these aren't hardcore educated poker fans. They're just maybe Dan Negrano fans because they saw him grow up and become this famous person back in the day. So he doesn't really need to play the game or participate in kind of the world that we're a part of. Like he doesn't need to give us any time of day if he doesn't want to. He makes time for his relationships with people that he knows, which are Poker Central. He knows the people that are in charge of Poker Central for a while. So they have that relationship where he'll go on there and do content with them. And then some other times as well, too, he'll go on some other stuff. So he's able to still maintain that relevancy around the community and, and maintain the attention of the community quite well. And I think he realizes now, like, he's got money, he's got opportunity, just say whatever the fuck he wants to say. He can do whatever he wants to do. And if people say bad things, who cares? Because he's putting on a show, he's an entertainer, and he thinks he's a character in the poker world. So I think that's what he's trying to do. And he's just like, I don't mind act. I don't mind wearing my tank top and having a, a really dark tan and, and slamming on the fucking chair. Like, he doesn't mind that. I don't know. He's like, he's like, that's cool. Like, that's, I'm, I'm a character. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, okay, let, let him go wrestle. <laughs> what he wants to do, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But I'm, as you said about the Doug videos, like, I didn't really want to talk about those kind of things, but I know how to make content that's going to crush. So I can do it anytime I want to do it. It's just a matter of if I want to cover those things. I know what to cover and how to, how to make it so it does well. But it's just like, I don't really care to cover a lot of the things I think would do well. So I just, you know, sometimes I do other things that I, I like and I care about and people I want to promote and stuff like that. Good stuff. Well, an easy segue from Daniel to GG, uh, perhaps uh, there's been, it feels like a, a daily firefighting exercise by them at the moment. And uh, I have a trio of stories I want to get through. One is from maybe 10 days ago. Patrick Leonard appeared on Robbie Straczynski's new show, The Orbit, and made a really volatile shots across the bow statement. Um, you know, possibly, <laughs> I don't know, with, with, with party poker's interest in mind, possibly just seeing what he was seeing and, and calling a spade a spade. But he, he basically complimented um, GG for having the best innovation. Uh, he pointed out the really good software, which they do have, their Snapcam feature, which they just premiered, which people were enjoying. But he also pointed out that they seem to be very innovative when it comes to circumventing regulations. And one of the main ones being, <laughs> you know, people, <laughs> people in different <laughs> countries you're not supposed to play in. So, would, you know, uh, that made me kind of think about the UIGA, and you know, we're talking like nine years down the line now since the UIGA sort of, well, it's, it's longer, it's 12 years since it, it passed, but it's nine years since Black Friday and its impact was felt in the States. And you guys have been sort of off on your own island since then in a pretty terrible spot where you have grey market games, you have these new They're app terrible. games, and terrible. you can play live games. And that's you know, not really the same as being part of the global poker community via online. And I wanted to ask, and this is kind of a weird way of coming at it, I know, but is it immoral and is it unethical? And what is the difference between those two things to provide a way to play poker for people in America? Obviously, the law is against them. The regulations are against them, but there do seem to be ways to circumvent it. Players want it arguably it's not fair that they're not allowed to have it. So are these operators being kind of Wild West providing a service that, you know, they ultimately want to justify on moral grounds? Are they purely exploiting a, a population who are ring fenced and can't be accessed unless you do something slightly untoward? Yeah, it's probably, it's probably like a, a mixture of both. I mean, I think, is it like, is it, is it a moral or an ethical? I mean, if it's a moral and ethical, like poker is just the wrong business to be in in the first place. So if you're not a fan of that activity, like you're not in the poker business, right? You look around the poker world, you're going to find a lot of shit if you really want to find it. Like you can look anywhere, you can look with operators, you can look in games, players, colluding, software. There's so many areas you could potentially look and find things you're like, oh, not, that doesn't look very good. So is it a moral to offer poker you know, I don't mean that's a, that's a great question, right? Because you look at global poker and they've somehow circumvented the law through a loophole and now they can offer poker, right? They do sweepstakes and, you know, it doesn't make any fucking sense, right? So if if that's legal, but another site offering poker there, they're, they're illegal because they're not doing the same loophole. You know what I mean? It just doesn't make much sense to me. It seems like these laws were put together a long time ago to some degree or how they work is is not based off of is something right or wrong. It's like who gets paid off or who lobbies the hardest or who knows the right person or 
what people made the right relationships in spots where it really mattered. That that's more what it seems like to me in these situations and like global finds a loophole. They do that. So I don't know. I'm still really developing my thoughts as I learn more about the business and learn how the business works and seeing the issues and challenges that people face. But the people that are offering games in America through applications or like ACR or any of these things like that. I mean, I think they want to give people poker. They are poker players. They want people to be able to play poker. They like to operate games and they think it's fun. So I think that's why they are willing to take that risk and do it. And a lot of people are doing it right now, it seems like. And Dara, how do you feel about the vulnerable position it puts players in? Obviously, you have this marketplace of all these lads who want to play and you're providing them a way to do it. But then their money isn't really safe in the same way, is it? Yeah, well, for me, that's the real issue. I mean, pretty much every European country now has fairly um, fairly rich regulation that covers um, online poker. And poker players sometimes think that regulation is necessarily a bad thing, but that's not actually the case. Most of the regulations that have been put in place in Europe are, are about consumer protection. Um, and around that area in general. The, the problem when you have a, a sort of a gray market like the US is that essentially the players, even if they can get on and they want to play, and I agree, I don't think there's anything immoral or unethical with, with, with players playing um, just because it happens to be against the law. But the problem is they're, they're basically completely unprotected and the sites can do whatever they want. And um, there's absolutely no incentive on the site to act honorably towards those players because those players essentially have no legal recourse. Um, and, and that's, huge I think that's problem. the biggest issue. Huge problem, huge problem. What you're saying. I mean, that's massive, right? It's like very underreported because why would you want to report it? I mean, why would you want to point this out in some ways? It's like, that's going to make everything kind of look bad. But what you're saying, dude, is such a huge issue that I get messaged about all the time, whether it's even from an agent, and a, an agent side or a player side too. And that's a really good point. If you're someone who's looking at poker and you go, you want me to send money on Venmo or crypto to some random dude who like has a reputation, you know, it's just kind of a shitty way to do things. So yeah, I don't think it's very good at all. And I, I you know, I, I kind of underestimated how big a problem that was until you pointed out like that. I think that's, that's a really good point. It's just, it's so sketchy and shady to a lot of people that that turns people off right away. Well, speaking of the sketchy, shady things that can happen to players who are vulnerable in this way and, and, and really w w situations where the sites can sort of do whatever they want, I want to be very specific now and talk about something. I have a few notes regarding this because I don't want to get any of the details wrong. The second story involving GG is about Tobias Dutzweiler, who had 180k confiscated and his account with GG poker shut down for what he alleged were wrongful reasons. GG ambassador Federal Holt spoke up. I think he probably regrets doing so. Initially, it seemed <laughs> without all the facts uh, at his disposal, I think it was in an effort, a, a very honest effort to try and shed, shed light on the situation and solve it. But, you know, he ultimately kind of embroiled himself in something a bit messier. After the subsequent uproar in poker community, Twitter, and, and whatnot. GG finally responded saying that they simply followed company protocol when seizing funds from a player who had violated terms of service, namely their rule about bum hunting, they used that word, and predatory behavior, and then said that he failed to abide by a subsequent ban. He had actually uh, previously been on the site via a skin, uh, a skin that may or may not have actually already closed down, but anyway, it, was, it was the skin who banned him, which obviously meant that the platform banned him, and he joined on, gave all his honest information again, nothing underhanded in, in what he was trying to do there, but they didn't spot the same thing. Um, I think there are GDPR reasons for why companies can't share that information. So you can see why maybe GG were a bit um, caught out there where they wouldn't have been allowed have that knowledge, even though it was one of their skins. It, it's not technically the same company. So it was at the point at which he wanted to do quite a substantial cash out and his name was being made public because uh, their policy for this World Series stuff was to have name players and using their real names, which obviously then they realized, oh, hang on a minute, uh, this is the guy we banned years ago or however long ago it was. Dara, what is bum hunting in your eyes? And, and I suppose it's a very loaded phrase that they chose to use. Yeah, I'm stunned that they actually use this term. It's 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 a it's not really a term 
um, a corporation should use to describe its customers. Um, I think the whole culture around poker has improved in recent years. We've, we've come up with better ways to refer to um, recreational players, be they recreational players, fun players, whatever, rather than the old nomenclature, which was, you know, fish, fish or donkeys or, uh, but, but bum hunting is this weird phrase because if you're if 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 you refer to what eff- effectively is aggressive game selection um, as bum hunting, then you're suggesting that the uh, the losing players are bums. Which uh, I mean, just because somebody hasn't gone to the trouble of getting good at poker but still enjoys playing poker, that it, that, that doesn't make them a bum. I mean, can, can we can we please use a different term for them? So I was really surprised to see GG use this term. I was also surprised to see their objection to it because obviously it's it's always matters of degree, but game selection is part of the process for any pro. Any and the sites can put rules in place there to make it more difficult. Um, for example, a table can be anonymous until you join it, so you can't just uh, trawl the lobbies and decide which game you want to to join. You can use anonymous usernames like a lot of sites do. So the onus is really on the sites. Not uh, if 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 the sites allow it to happen, they can't blame pros for aggressively game selecting and trying to get into the best games. Um, and to refer to it as bomb hunting just seems bizarre to me. Um, it's part of this narrative which has come up in recent years, ever since Stars basically started this whole fuck the pros initiative, let's say. There's been this <laughs> attempt to portray pros as predatory, um, uh, unethical, uh, essentially cheating, and to portray recreational players as these poor, weak, uh, the, these weaklings that have to be protected in some way by the site. Um, that's not a, that's not a good way to sell poker in my view. Um, to tell people, look, if you come onto our site, there'll be all these people who are bum hunting you. We'll, but we'll try and ban a few of them now and then. Um, you know, that's not a good way to sell the game. I don't think we seem to have moved on from sort of the original was play with the pros to, um, to now it's like, well, let's not play with the pros. Let's ban the pros and um, let the uh, let the bombs play among themselves. Yeah. Well, Joe, I want to bring you back in here because I know you follow the same account I do, an anonymous account, Rachel Lee's. Fantastic account. Well worth to follow anyone out there uh, for just like huge long Twitter threads. I don't know how this person has as enough time they seem to live a very <laughs> life yet they seem to also tweet 200 times a day and it's usually really clever really well thought out you know interesting stuff some of it crosses over with the world of poker i think rachel lee's whoever that person really is certainly played poker probably an older person i would guess 40s 50s i don't even know if it's a man or woman but um it seems to be familiar with some of the more old school players so maybe comes from that generation but always with fantastic insights, uh, as I said, well worth the follow. Rachel Lee said, when natural behaviors, brackets, targeting the weak in a competitive game, which is, of course, what we do as poker players, can be punished indiscriminately with flexible rules. It's a recipe for corrupt, unfair business tactics. GG is now the actual threat itself. They have become the predator. Joey, I'd like to get your take on that and, and maybe also, you know, maybe in a general way on, on some of the other comments Rachel has put forward. Yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. I didn't read that from from her. I talked to Rachel a lot and on DMs, and always gives me really good insight. Always gives me really advice. I, my my uh, theory is that it might be me in like fifteen, twenty years, like talking to myself <laughs> and like sharing all these because they. If I was going to use that strategy on Twitter, like I, I feel like I could be more insightful and more thought out on a lot of my things. But I use like a different Twitter strategy, so I don't share too many of those deeper thoughts, and I don't get that much in the strategy, anyways. To begin with, I kind of like you just talk about different things. So that's, uh, I mean, that you point that out, it's very interesting, right? I think about to my, my days as being a hundred percent player was that I used one of like the sickest game selection strategy I think was going on at the time on poker stars in order to make hundreds of thousands of dollars playing. And now should that have been allowed, right? In retrospect, like if I'm looking at myself now, I'm like get the fuck, get that guy out of here. You know what I mean? Like I was also, I think Gigi kind of talks about it. They want good pros to be like basically like poker promoters, like ambassadors. They want content creators. They want people with, with podcasts, like you guys, like myself. They want people who are going to teach the game, build the game, promote the game out there. They're basically saying, we want to find and keep people and pay people, give them opportunity, give them money, give them support who are going to help grow our brand, GG Poker, and also help grow the overall poker ecosystem. So when they're saying good pro, bad pro, 
you know, whatever what was the average pro or something like that, right? Average pro, someone who's working hard at their yep. game, just trying to be fair, trying to battle. Seems to me what they want to get rid of are these people that are using, they, they're just, they don't do like they sit in their basement, they go to the computer, they go play and they only sit down when a terrible player is sitting there. They don't really get much action. They're not really tight players. They don't really provide much. They're coming up with a solution to a problem that's been around for a very long time that poker stars or no one else decided to solve. They didn't want to look at it. So now GG is coming up with their own solution to the issue. I look at them as like ACR in a way, right? They're just kind of running and gunning, doing a bunch of shit. They're way smarter at marketing. They brought in Daniel Negreanu and Fader Holes and Bryn Kenny. My man, Phil Nagy down in Costa Rica, brought in Bo Ski and, and Lon Carr and DePaulo. So they, they're using a different marketing strategy. That's all that is there is just, you look at this and you see Negreanu. If Negreanu was with ACR, we would all think ACR is a little bit better. That's how these ambassadors, that's how that all works out. It's all just this smoke and mirror sort of act. So in terms of what's happening behind the scenes, it, it seems to be like they're just willing to do a bunch of crazy shit and try a bunch of crazy things. And, and I mean, you can look at it, is it bad for, for the game? I mean, in some ways it seems like it is. Could it be something that turns into good? I hope so. I'm just, I just stay optimistic anyway. But with that policy, are they the, now the threat? Are they the people that are threatening players? I mean, it sounds like a pretty good business idea, isn't it, David? Right? Like you're just going to say, yeah, like you're fucking out of here. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? You're, you're taking money. money from my bottom line. Like you're gone. Hey, maybe one of my inside men, you come over here, you get in these games, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm sure good pro that I pay to stream on Twitch. Like, Hey, why don't you come play the game? You know? So that's, that's mm -hmm. what it seems like happens is if they see somebody who's making money from their business, they, well, your business is done. We're going to bring in someone else. So is that a good thing? It seems like a good business. Is that good for poker? I mean, it's good for me personally, because I'm one of those good pros. So I'd be, I'd be in the position, they'd be banning these people, they'd be letting me in. <laughs> so is it good for me personally? Very good for me. Is it bad for a lot of other players out there? Yeah, it seems that way. How could it be good? <laughs> I mean, I just don't see how it's good for a lot of those guys. Is it better for the recreationals losing players? It probably is. Because do you really want to play with these guys that aren't making any mistakes and kind of just waiting for you to play? No. Like when I go play on, on the private game now, I don't want to play with these guys. Like I'm, I'm telling my guy like, Hey, why don't we get these guys out of here, man? It's one table. Like, you know, these guys don't need to be here. So I understand that from the recreational standpoint too. And I can understand that from a professional standpoint. And I think what it means to be a professional, if you want to play on GG poker would evolve in this situation. And of course they're going to make some bans and people aren't going to agree with it. And that's the PR that they're going to have to deal with. And they're going to have to justify that. And we're going to have to stand up for players rights because it's easy to bash around the players, but the players need people to speak out about issues to figure out a middle ground sometimes. And I think that's what people like yourself or people like myself try to do. Yeah. And I suppose uh, you, you called us the, the good regs who sort of contribute back into the community with content and whatnot. And, uh, and that's the kind of people they want. Maybe after this pod podcast episode, we won't specifically be the people they want. Anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think, I, I think I can, I can understand that. I talk with them a lot and you know what? Like they need people to call these things out too. Like you can't, you, it, sure it'd be nice if you could just do whatever the fuck you wanna do and you can just say, oh, we're taking this money, taking that money. But when you're taking $108,000 from players, like you need the other side to challenge you because maybe you're wrong. And that's how you get better at your business. And that's how they're gonna improve at their business. They listen to feedback that people have to say, we're paying attention, we're researched, we're trying to understand as best as we can. We give them our feedback. They listen to that if they respect that, which I believe that they do respect the opinions of the poker people. And they ultimately, try to improve their business. So that's what I see happening in this situation. So I see people like us as important to the ecosystem because we don't just don't let these, these kind of operators do this kind of whatever they want to do just because Daniel Grano said it's okay. Hmm. Well, given their sort of position where they wanted to insist that they were now going to ban people who broke their rules and whatever, it was a very strange reversal or flip-flop maybe three or four days ago when they announced via their Twitter feeds that they were going to do a sort of a two week scamnesty where anybody who had been bold or and felt maybe that they were harshly judged or whatever had a two week window, conveniently two weeks until late reg closes on the main event um, <laughs> to, to go back yeah. and make an account uh, and, and potentially be reinstated. Uh, opening a huge Pandora's box of problems. I thought Dara, when I heard this, because, we do know about 
situations where people were rightly banned from sites where for actual cheating we're not talking about the vague kind of bum hunting game selecting stuff that we'd sort of have sympathy for particularly when it's not really you know written in stone where the line is on that stuff but like is it is it a weird po- I, I couldn't believe what i was reading that they literally posted on twitter we're willing to take you back players who we've banned yeah, I mean, it seems weird because, as you said, there's players are banned for different reasons, and some people are some players are banned for very good reasons, and there are players who are banned for life from stars, for example, um, and it would be pretty horrific if they were allowed back for for, for for some of the stuff they did. Now, we don't know the obviously the individual specifics of the case, uh, and I haven't been following as closely as you, so I don't know whether it's a just a general scamnesty where everybody is getting let back in, or they're going to be selective about it. It's it, it's a weird idea, but then GG is a pretty new company, so just to give them a little bit of um, the benefit of the doubt. They might be figuring some of some of this stuff out on the fly. Um, mm-hmm. We've already seen them reverse other policies this summer in relation to the WSP when sort of the poker community uh, was up in arms about it. So it's it's a good thing that they are at least willing to listen and engage with the poker community and and, and reverse the decisions. Whether this is a spe- specificity is a good idea or not, I don't know. It's, it 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 does seem weird to say on the one hand, oh, we're protecting all the recreational players by getting rid of these bad pros. And then to come back and say, well, actually, we're going to let the bad pros back uh, if they send us a, a, a nicely worded email. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a weird mixed message. Yeah, it is a weird mixed message. <laughs> Joe, you were very quick to pick up on, on the statement when it came out. You tweeted, GG Poker clarified its stance on what type of poker pros it is looking for on its website. What do you think? Uh, to which Phil Galfond was very quick. And bear in mind, Phil Galfond, the owner of another site, somebody who never really wants to put you know, his foot into a kind of a controversial melting pot. But he was pretty quick and pretty clear when he said, at this point, I think they're insulting the poker community's intelligence. Yeah, I mean, I I don't really know what Phil meant by that, actually. I thought about it a little bit because I saw he put that up there. I mean, I think these guys are just clicking buttons, man. They don't know what the fuck they're doing, right? (laughs) They're trying a bunch of things. They got some guys that kind of know some things and they're just like, well, what what are they really like? What are they going to have to model this after? What are they going to look at? Poker stars, party, like, there isn't much business in poker. There's not many other poker sites you look at and say, well, how did they do it? You know, there's a few examples and look where they got us, right? I mean, did they get us like, could be a lot better, right? You look at other industries. I look at other industries all the time. I'm always researching and I go, fuck man, like poker's just, yeah. you know, I look around and I say, I can't believe it. This sucks in some mm-hmm. ways because I see how, how companies and other industries run, especially upstart industries where there's people that are just knowledgeable about how things work in a, in a new day and age. So I feel like with GG, they're one of these new people, they're new companies, they're just figuring it out on their own. They, I don't know if they know much about PR or how to like do those kind of things or not. It didn't seem like it. And that's fine. They got a lot to learn. So mm-hmm. they, they're still new. They just been around for, I think, what, like five years or something like that. So yeah, I yeah, just look at them as they're just trying to figure this out. Like, is it going to, it's like an experiment. That's what I said. It's like an experiment. They're just trying a new approach. Is it going to work? Is it going to not work? I, I don't know. We're going to find out. But what what else are the other options in some ways? You know, yeah. there's still parties, still poker stars. Like what, what else really was there before GG came and kind of lit a little bit of fire into the community and into poker stars efforts and their marketing approach and the tournament series. Like they came in and really shook things up a little bit. And like, I don't know, maybe they changed the trajectory of the overall industry because it didn't seem like it was necessarily skewing up with just the main operators as they are now. And I mean, Poker Stars is doing some things better on the marketing front, which I like to see. Mm-hmm. Other sites are absolutely fucking terrible at what they do in terms of marketing on the new platforms these days, like with YouTube and Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat. Like you study their strategy, I study them all, and I'm just like, I'm in shock at, at like how these companies could make so much revenue and have such terrible marketing strategies in terms of what the new day and age is. But then I talk to the people and I understand why it's because they haven't learned and they're older school marketers. They've been around poker a long time. Like, you know, they got to hit the fucking lab. I'll get in the lab with me. They want to study with me. I'll, I'll teach them what I, I'll teach them what I know. I'll teach them how to copyright, teach them how to make content, teach them how to break the things down and build a nice community and build a nice strategy in order to build your brands and poker because, and uh, so, you know, I get excited about that, but I think with GG, they're trying to do some things and they're trying to take a modern approach to it. It appears that professionals are going to make money. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I see positive and negative in what they're doing. 
Sure. To follow up on what you said there, like, and, and I agree, I think you're an excellent role model in, in this sense because there is no better hype machine in poker, frankly. And there's an integrity that comes with that. You know, you wouldn't be able to pull that off time and time again when you want to force eyes on a certain thing that you think is worthy if you didn't have that integrity or that sort of um, reputation. And the thing that kills me, to be honest, and the thing that I sort of, when I take a step back and look at poker for the last five, six years, I guess from sort of just pre Amaya taking over stars, was dishonesty coming from the sites. You know, poker players are generally smarter than your average person, I think. And I think they appreciate people being honest with them, whether it was these Hullriser, um sort of statements that were basically saying fuck the pros but not not saying fuck the pro basically saying that you know pros and rex you rex you should all hate the pros because they're like basically turning players against one another when in fact actually what they wanted to do was carve out another couple of percent of all the deposits and and really that was their methodology they wanted to rake up the games they wanted to turbo up the games and they wanted to keep more of it but they thought well that won't play well if we're just honest about what we're doing here so let's distract here and let's kind of create a another argument uh, internally between the, the different types of players and the different standards of players and it just really has always bugged me so much Darren I spoke ad nauseum about this at the time because it was so obviously what their strategy was and it was so dishonest you can handle somebody saying look we have to address the ecosystem it's not really sustainable anymore the supernova elite program is probably too generous we have to scale back but like don't like well first of all don't steal that money a year on when everyone's already earned it on the assumption that they were getting it but secondly be honest about what your new policy and what your new approach is going to be. I suppose it's the mixed messaging that's killing me. And Dara, to come back to you on this one, GG have con consistently been mixed messaging, whether it's like, we don't want pros, we'll have the pros back again. Something that Joey actually said this week, he said, uh, if a poker site hires the biggest winning poker players in poker tournament history and the most prestigious event series to promote its site, while also doing interviews talking about how professional poker players aren't welcome on the site, the marketing message just doesn't line up yeah i agree i agree with that completely it's 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 a, it's a very weird um mixed message but then on the other hand i mean it's somewhat effective with the sense that we're talking about it and we're giving them all this free airtime and they have come from a site almost nobody had heard of six months ago to now being the site that everybody's talking about they've done really well in the short term in terms of customer acquisition which is something which is very very difficult in the um, online poker space in general so they've done really well but now they have to sort of move from there to customer retention um mm -hmm. and it remains to be seen whether they ha have the um the ethos to do that uh, i already know quite a few players who have just they try this side they've just feel uneasy about what's happened there and they've taken their money off and they, uh, and they won't go back because they feel it's uh it's a disaster, a disaster waiting to happen. So it's going to be interesting after the WSAP. I mean, the WSAP is, is pulling them along at the moment because it's such a big brand in its own right. And, and it's, it's getting everybody onto GG. Even if they're not playing, people are going on to rail the WSAP. Um, one of the great things they've done, obviously, is uh, the staking thing. I know people who have deposited money on GG who will never actually play poker there. All they, all, all they will do is they'll buy 1% of different players in WSAP events and then rail it, and that's their entertainment. So on some levels, they've been incredibly clever, and it has translated into customer acquisition. The problem is they've left a sort of a bad taste in the mouth uh, by some of the methods that they've done it, and also by the idea that they can literally change the rules anytime they want, uh, that there's no great consistency there. I mean, a few people have asked me about uh, should they go on the site or not? And, you know, obviously, as you know about ambassador, I'm not really supposed to encourage people to go onto the sites, but I do give my honest opinion. And, and my honest opinion right now is, yes, there's a lot of great games on there. Uh, the action is very good, but I wouldn't leave a significant amount of money there. That's the, uh, the, the that's the sort of proviso, and I they're not the only site that I would say that about. To a, a, ACR, I tend to issue a similar caveat. Whereas you know when you look at Party, you look at Stars, you look at the um, the more reputable sites. I would never worry about how much money I had on those sites. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one final thing on all of this, because I guess, you know, we have sort of uh, belabored the GG conversation uh, to, to maybe the nth degree here. But I am interested to know whether the World Series of Poker are happy. As you said there, Dara, 
enormous brand in its own right, could drag any site along, really. It's so powerful. Everybody wants a bracelet. Everyone feels that that's part of poker history. They've been caretakers for the game and pretty decent stewards of the game overall for a long, long time, maybe worthy of some criticism in more recent years, but certainly been um, a pretty phenomenal caretaker of the biggest brand in poker. And I am interested to know, like, first and foremost, it's not the World Series of Poker. It has been the World Series of Hold'em with a little sprinkling of Omaha. Had they gone to Stars, which I know Stars wanted it, I know the reason the Stadium Series and all that fandangled setup looks so good is because Stars were pretty sure they were going to get it. And that was going to be how they were going to make it look. And it was going to be very impressive. And they were going to have all the games because Stars have all the games. And that was going to be a proper World Series of Poker. Now, whether it was Daniel's influence, whether it was Gigi's backroom people's influence, whatever mm. it was, but it's managed to convince World Series of Poker to go with the upstart site rather than the established site who could have certainly done more, probably would have had less issues with disconnects. Everybody has a Stars account already, so there wouldn't have been that rush to get money on and all those other problems that, that maybe have, have ensued. I am interested to know whether the World Series feel like they're happy with their call. I'm interested to know whether you think they are or would they be regretting it and thinking, oh, we should have gone with the safe bet. Well, I think I think why, uh, why they didn't go with Poker Stars is probably a, a couple of different reasons, but one might be the competitive aspect of things where World Series of Poker and Poker Stars might have some bad blood for some things that happened in the past. So maybe they don't want to go, okay, we're going to help build Poker Stars brand up because you can see World Series is like, well, can we, should we go with an upstart who we can now say, GG, do we have a relationship forever here? So now World Series and GG did two series. So now in the future, they'll probably do more series. Do we want to be associated with GG or do we want to be associated with Poker Stars? We've seen how Poker Stars does business. They probably have some bad blood in the past. I think that's, that's what happened is they just said, oh, we'd rather go with this other company and we'd rather gamble in that situation there. What was the second part of your question, David? No, that, 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 that's pretty much it. I'm interested to know okay. maybe, Dara, you, you might just agree with Joey there or, or do you have a different perspective on that? Yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I, I obviously can't speak for the WSOP. I think th th like every other live operator, they had a difficult situation and a difficult call to make. They couldn't have a, the live event, so, the, so their only option was to run it online. When they announced it, there was a sort of a big debate about will these bracelets have the same prestige and status as normal bracelets? How will the series be received, etc.? I wasn't too sure, I have to say in advance, um, because if anything, it could be more difficult to win an online bracelet, given that all the beasts from all over the world are going to play it. N now that we've seen the series play out, I have to say, we can answer absolutely categorically, no, it just, it's, it's not the same. There, there isn't the same buzz or excitement around people winning bracelets. Um, when I, every year, even before I travel out to Vegas, I would be religiously following um, the final tables, who's doing well, who's who's won a bracelet. This this year, I, I really don't care very much. I'm delighted to see Daniel Devores on top of the leaderboard. Uh, I think he's a brilliant guy. And that's, that's probably the only thing that's really sort of registered with me. The thing I would say from an Irish perspective is, and you know this, David, as well, as somebody who's been a stalwart on the Irish scene for 10 years, it's, it's 12 or 13 years now since... Um, an Irish pair won a bracelet in Vegas. We have to go all the way back to Marty Smith uh, winning the PLO in 2008, I think. And it was always a big deal about like, will an Irish pair, who, who, who'll be the Irish pair that will win a bracelet? And, you know, when I got heads up, that was a huge deal. When I came back, people, everybody wanted to talk to me about it. The same year, Mark McDonald Mac got heads up and, um, uh, a couple of other Irish players and it, 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 it created a real buzz and but this year two Irish players actually won bracelets and not a single Irish poker fan or recreational has asked me anything about it it's like it, 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 it's like it just hasn't registered so I think from the perspective of live players they just don't view it as the same they just see well this is just an online series so it's it's definitely not the same thing yeah that's an interesting point uh, I agree with that I want to change completely can I, can, I, can I talk about that one real quick because I'm actually interested to hear you guys opinion because I don't have anybody else to talk to about this kind of stuff so I'm very okay. curious about what you guys think about this so I've been noticing the same thing that Dara was saying was just like they're doing this event and if it would have been a, I mean if it was on poker stars this would be one of the biggest things in the world hmm. all right because poker stars has the PR connections they have the connections to 
news outlets that are outside of poker to generate buzz in that type of way, which then generates more interest in the poker world. So Poker Stars is a lot better at PR than GG Poker is in terms of just knowing more people. So GG Poker doesn't really have a brand for itself right now. Like no one really cares who's winning on GG Poker in general. So I think they that is that's what's Twitter happening. followers, Joey. They have about a third of your Twitter followers. <laughs> Who does GG Poker? Yeah. Yeah, I mean they're gonna. It's gonna. Nat, they're giving up. They're giving away. They're spending so much money on acquisition for followers that if they're gonna get more than all of us. But right, exactly. If you go down their Instagram, if you go on that stuff, they don't really have a presence at all. Like no one knows who the fuck they are. So when you hear World Series on GG Poker, you're like, whatever. So if it was on Poker Stars, I think it would mean so much more to casuals, which would then cause the professionals to feel like it means more. But when I watch this now, it's like, you know, I don't know. I don't really like. I, I just, I'm struggled to care at all in some ways. And maybe it is the bad PR that they've been getting that has impacted my own personal belief because I just feel like maybe there's some crazy things happen over there. So, mm-hmm. and also I know the World Series poker kind of like, I, it doesn't seem like they really care too much. Like they're, I don't know if they're promoting the event or if they're really doing much content, like they're not creating their own content and it doesn't seem like anybody else really cares. So why yeah. would anyone else, why would, why mm-hmm. would the, the recreationals care? if the professionals don't care and if the biggest companies don't seem to care that much. Well, seeing as you had uh, another thing to say, and uh, I want to second what you said there, Joey, I I think I would have struggled to take it the same way had it been online on any site. But I do think that had it been a more fulsome World Series of Poker on Stars with all the games offered, with their media machine, with their commentary and ability to kind of get the different news outlets involved as well, I think it could have been better. I don't know whether it would have been the same. I don't think it could have been the same, but I think it would have been a more prestigious feeling thing. And, uh, and, and yeah, yeah. So I think great, great points from both of you. I do want to finally change the subject up to something um, a bit more, maybe uh, easy. <laughs> no, no controversy maybe with this one. Joey, you've been in this game for a long time, uh, podcasting, creating content. I'm interested to know, because it's something Darren and I talk about a bit. Who is on your wish list? Oh, for podcast? Yeah. Who would you love to interview who's never, who's always seemed just out of reach? Oh, definitely Doyle Brunson, man. That dude's a legend. That dude's crazy. Can you imagine the stories Doyle Brunson has about like killing people? I mean, I don't want him to come on the <laughs> whoa, pod and whoa, like whoa. admit that he's out of line, but you don't think that guy has done the craziest shit that if we knew what he did, we'd be like, oh, maybe we should get this guy out of the fucking poker world. You don't think Doyle Brunson? <laughs> He's on video talking about people dying in games. He played, he, I posted it today. He said he played five days straight in a poker game. He saw multiple people die. They <laughs> got shot and died at the table. You don't think this guy has the craziest stories in the history of poker? Absolutely he does. This guy, I mean, there's probably a reason he doesn't do interviews, right? He just knows the craziest shit of all time. And I love that poker history. I love the game. I love the, 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 the glorious players of our game. You know, it's like the personalities before, right? Like, what do they know? Right, like Barry Greenstein, this guy's crazy. He knows a bunch of, he knows, this guy talks for six hours on a podcast. He knows everything appears. So Doyle, Doyle, Doyle Brunson's top poker on my list for him, for sure. What about you guys? Do you guys have somebody you're trying to, you're trying to get? I feel like Darren might have said Doyle as well, but maybe he'll have to come up with another one. Yeah, well, I mean, Doyle would obviously be, I, I, I think from our perspective as well, the person we probably chase the most without actually getting is, uh, is Doug, Doug Polk. So yeah. Doug is obviously somebody we would like to ha- have on the podcast at some stage. Um, I think Ivy as well. Ivy is still an enigma. Um, he, he's in a, in a world where it seems every leading pro of his generation is incredibly overexposed. He's very, very underexposed. Um, uh, whether he'd actually be interesting or not, I'm not sure because sometimes the people who ma- maintain mystiques they do it by just saying nothing. And then when they start talking, the, the <laughs> magic is gone. On that perspective, I think somebody who I think, even though he doesn't do um, podcast interviews, who I think would be brilliant if he did, would be Eric Seidel. Um, Seidel has been around forever as well and mm-hmm. has sort of stood the test of time, uh, just quietly doing his own uh, his own thing. So, yeah, I mean, those are probably the guys. Obviously, we've tried to get some of the, um, the online beasts as well who tend to stay under the radar we've been lucky enough to get some of them um but a lot of the guys just deliberately decide that they're going to stay under the radar and um that's that's kind of it's unfortunate because they're the, i think they're the people that resonate most with our audience and um, we've always found that when we have 
some genuine online crusher on uh, that resonates much more with our audience than some of the old schoolers uh, who might have more interesting stories, but maybe not quite as relatable to, to the online generation. Yeah, that's a great point. The one I would love to do is Chris Ferguson. And I know that would be a prickly one and it would be a kind of a controversial, would Whoa, be a difficult you're, one. You're, you're like going the deep end, kid. You're like, <laughs> I want to hop right in. Well, see, I want to hop in with the most pressure interviewed I've ever done. Yeah, because Chris wouldn't Ferguson be never does interviews and I've got questions and I got to get answers because people are going to rely on me to get answers. You're like a real, yeah, real madman hop. You're going to yeah. be like Ross Nixon and you're thinking to yourself, okay, you get to kind of flex a little bit. But also, actually, to be honest, deep down, I do feel like if Chris had ever come forward and given his side of the story, letter or file style, or he had ever sort of been more of a approachable figure in the aftermath, I do believe genuinely that while he is very much deserved of a huge amount of criticism, particularly his decision to appoint Ray Batar in that position of CEO and not really pay enough attention, pay close enough attention to what shenanigans was going on, and it was pretty bad. I do think that his own personal story within all of that is actually more sympathetic than people realize. It's complicated. There's going to be a lot of criticism, but I'd I'd hope that that interview would also include some of the aspects of it that were fair to him and that showed that he was willing to put money back into the company so that it could remain a viable product that was worth purchasing Hmm. so that the players got their money back and things like that too. So, you know, that, that's, a, and that's a tricky tight rope to walk, I think. You're telling me I should go take an investigation trip, it sounds like. I mean, I know a lot of people now, so <laughs> I mean, hey, I make a call, you know, and maybe, maybe I get some answers, some questions we might, we might have about the situation. I have already know a lot about that situation. I don't, even, I don't even know what's public or private with it related to that, what happened there. And obviously it's been so long ago now that like people don't remember anyway, so. Hmm. I've been looking more into stories like that and saying, okay, like, what can I find? What can, like, maybe he does, maybe he's ready to talk, David, right? Maybe he's ready to sit down and he's ready to give his side of the story. Cause I agree. He probably would come out as a sympathetic figure. I'm sure he, right. He's not some evil kind of guy. Like people say nice things about him. I'm sure there is a side of his story and people would sympathize with that. And they'd also be pissed, but they'd also sympathize with that too. So I agree with you. Yeah, it would be a fun one. Finally, one last bit of fun with you, Joey, because you put out a, a really fun tweet there the other day, and I'm interested to know what your best responses were. You said, you know you're a poker player when dot, dot, dot. And I think you got about 400 responses. So can you give us maybe a couple of the best ones? Oh, I mean, I tried reading through them, and I just like, I was just so many. I go, oh, my God, this is a, it was a great tweet, right? It's like a great thing to put up there, but... Yeah, I don't remember anything. I, I like read through them and I was get so overwhelmed and I was like, I got to stop doing this. There's so many answers in here. So did any of them stand out to you that that that, that are? <laughs> I like the one where the guy, I think one guy said, uh, you know, you're a poker player when you can get an awful lot done in five minutes. Oh, that's a really good. You mean, seriously, if you read through that, you are you basically don't really realize how weird it is to be a professional poker player until you <laughs> read through that thread and see the responses. And you're like, yeah, you know, it is kind of fucking weird to wake up at 6 p.m. for two years straight to like, and that's, it's like a good schedule. And that's like the optimal schedule for you to make a lot of money and have like a fun life. That is a little weird, right? When you, when you really think about it and what jobs people are doing, that's strange. So I think there are a lot of unique things, right? Like a five minute pee break, you're peeing in bottles. Some people, I don't know about Dara, maybe Dara's probably peeing in bottles. I don't know, but <laughs> I know I've definitely been there before. I'd say we've trained our bodies that our bodies don't even, they're not even able to pee if it's not 55 minutes past the hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember tournaments before the synchronized breaks were even a thing. And that was that, 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 that was a difficult grind. The synchronized breaks make it easy. And like, like the tweet said, I mean, you, you really know what you can do in five minutes. Uh, we're really, really good at working out exactly what can be achieved in five minutes. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, not, not, so, not so good. All the 20 minutes, I think live players have a good handle on too because the typical live break tends to be 20 minutes. So yeah, I'd say online players are really good at working out what can be done in five minutes, live players in 20 minutes. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you probably remember too, David, because I think you played tournaments back in the day when there were no sy- synchronized breaks. Every site had their own schedule. So, so it was like... <laughs> Okay, well, two of the th- two of my six sites are on break now, so maybe I can run to to the bathroom and not miss too many uh, hands. Well, I, ha- I I hate to admit on 
camera now what I actually used to do, but I played on a laptop. I used to, I was able to 40 table real efficiently on a 15 inch MacBook for years uh, with the trackpad and everything. I was just able to whiz around. So I used to just bring it with me to the toilet. Just bring oh, no. it in. Is this the laptop you're on? I want to see a video of you doing this. No, it's not the laptop. laptop. <laughs> and I, Ian, I want to see that. Not that, not that <laughs> part. <laughs> I used to do kind of a posh wee, like a sit down wee with the laptop. <laughs> yeah. One of my fondest memories from when we were traveling on the EPT circuit was we were doing our Sunday grind in London and uh, <laughs> table space and room space in general was at a premium. So you actually just went into the bath and lay down in the bath. 40 right. tabling on your laptop what? now i'm starting to wonder if that was just what you normally did because that <laughs> you literally have gone anytime you want it <laughs> well, yeah, i remember that because you you had a suite the rest of us only had like a bum's room but you actually got the nice suite so you said okay guys you can grind yeah. in my room but there was like 10 of us so, yeah. big. so i headed into, i headed into the bath that's right i remember that someone took a photo and sent it to ept live that's right yeah yeah <laughs> It's an old school story right there, man. What, what, you guys did that? You said you guys were playing all in a room? Yeah. yeah we, we, it was EBT London, and there was about 10 Irish lads who knew each other. And obviously, we, we, we weren't still in the, in the live tournament anymore by the time Sunday came around, so we were going to do the, the, the Sunday grind. But we need, you always need somewhere where there's a reliable internet. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the hotel suite would seem, seem like the best bet. Um, so y'all piled in the hotel suite, 10 people on computers grind, grinding the tournament. Yeah, literally every, uh, uh, literally crammed in like people on uh, playing on ch uh, chairs being used as tables, people squatting on the floor. And in David's case, David uh, lying in the bath. Um, <laughs> <laughs> completely like shoulded, no water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally just using the bath as a receptacle. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Just, to, just, for, just in case anyone's getting a disturbing image there, I was fully clothed. I was wearing yeah. a, a hoodie. You yeah. weren't you so you weren't nude. You weren't nude in the bed. No, he wasn't nude. Okay. Exactly. Around nine other guys. Okay, good. No, yeah. the, the way I take my bad beats, it would have been dangerous to have a, a computer that close to water with me in it. That would have been well. Actually, that's the other thing. Yeah, D David. David's the only screamer in the group. <laughs> Every time he loses a flip, he starts screaming and swearing at the at the laptop. So. <laughs> I, th I think a few of the other guys did say like David needs to be in a different room when uh, <laughs> when, when we're doing our Sunday grind because he's just far too distracting, crying and screaming every time he loses a flip. Is that you? Do you still do that, David? You still big? You a big jungle manner? You go, ah? You start jamming <laughs> around in style like. Ah! You know what I mean? <laughs> I did twitch for a little while and I kind of felt like I, I owed it to the audience to kind of turn it up to 11 on you, that. You stuff. Negranu, the audience, it sounds like, right? You were banging on chairs and talking about shoving teeth up people's asses and stuff. And what is that what you're doing? Yeah, no, I don't think I used those words, but maybe some other <laughs> ones. I was very conscious of the fact that, like, while well, I'm there posting the video of Daniel uh, losing his mind that day, I was thinking, oh, God, people could definitely dig up some videos yeah. of me now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. It was such hypocrisy on your, on your part, calling him that, because you are literally the one guy who you could imagine punching a laptop or... That's what um, I said, too. I said, I feel like people are being harsh because it's Daniel. I mean, it's funny, but I've certainly raged before like that at the computer. Like, I've freaked out and wanting to bash the fucking computer screen in too. So I get exactly where he's coming from. I thought people were overly harsh about that. I think they were just not used to him doing it. And they're like, Negranu, like, why is he in this tank top and like little shorts kicking dogs? And, <laughs> and well, not kicking dogs, right? That was, in, that was in, the, in the edited video. You know, I don't want to put that out there. He wasn't kicking any dogs. No animals, I believe, allegedly were harmed in the process. But they're just like, what is this guy's problem? Like, he's a millionaire. He's... Yeah. sponsored by Gigi. He's got his blonde wife. He's in the tank top. He's got the little shorts on. He's got a tan. He looks like he dropped, lost about 65 pounds. Like what's wrong with this guy? And why is he acting this way? I think they were just confused. Like, you know, whereas if it's one of us, maybe that we just like, yeah, those guys seem a little fucking crazy. Maybe they will, they should act like that. Right. Maybe Dara, if he acted like that, it might be out of character. But if me or you, David acted like that, people would be like, yeah. Well, yeah. he might lose, like them. he might lose the rag, but like, you don't want to meet them. Dara for 10 minutes after he's been knocked out of a tournament. Yeah. <laughs> Not a very pleasant person. Uh, yeah, I, I, online never affects me, I have to say. I, I, I remember another time we were grinding, actually, in your place in Malta, David, and it was you, me, and Ian Simpson, and, uh, and Gareth was railing us. And Gareth said to me afterwards, like, you literally couldn't see three different contrasts in people. Ian is just like, every time he wins, he's all happy and giggling and 
punching the air because he just stole the blinds or something. Uh, and then you're screaming at all the screaming at all the lost flips, and I'm in the middle, like literally zero reaction in either direction. You don't even know whether I'm still in the tournament or not. Uh, th- these things are really, really personal, obviously. Um, but you know, when you when you're when when you're being watched by the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean twitch is funny because like people are actually like it, it'd be really boring to watch me on twitch because you would literally just watch me not reacting to anything that happens and <laughs> would say like, what is wrong with that guy like he just he he, he, he just lost the tournament or he just won a tournament and he's not he's, he's not even particularly happy i mean after my um biggest live result i remember people in ireland watching him back home the biggest question i got was like you didn't even seem excited like what what <laughs> there was there was no reaction at all um and that's boring to watch so uh you know we do need the people who are punching their screens as well oh yeah i I always said if i was a twitch streamer back when i was playing full-time i would have been by far the most popular twitch streamer because i was not only good at the game but i was also like a crazy person yeah even when i stream sometimes now like it's not i don't i don't need to say much when i'm playing like i can sit here be quiet the entire time but if i wanted to act i know how to i I know how to show my emotion i feel i just know it's not gto to show my emotion when i'm playing so i don't do it but if it's the point of streaming plus playing i just let it fly out there man it's so fun i love it it's a lot especially when you're winning when you're losing it hurts it hurts real bad but when you're winning it's beautiful so i don't know how i would handle twitch streaming but i can understand how that guy would like be lagging and want to hit his computer i mean i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that guy's i yeah. mean it's kind of funny right isn't it kind of funny like this guy I, I, we're seeing this dude evolve and now he's like punching computer screens i don't know it's kind of funny <laughs> like it's just <laughs> weird it's funny i don't know yeah you guys i know you guys have your history so you feel differently about him like you know i don't well, know actually i always felt kind of sympathetic to the disconnection thing and sort of bad beats i i, I didn't think it was nice to use the sort of threatening sort of stuff he said it's probably a little much but like no overall I didn't mind the shows of emotion I never commented negatively on it I did post it but I didn't say that I thought it was bad form yeah I felt I, I felt it humanized him in, in all mm. ways it's definitely something we could re- we could we could relate to and uh, you know it's not a big deal I mean if somebody's upset let them show they're upset that's uh, that, that, that that that's certainly fine I mean I mean returning to the GG thing I think as the only one of the three of us who plays on GG. I think maybe one of my reasons for my disaffection with the the, the WSP is that GG is now the one site on my uh, on my uh, desktop that just gives me the most trouble. Like mm-hmm. most disconnects. Oh, I'm now going to have to close the client again and reconnect and manually open tables. So there's just this huge negative association now in my mind with the site. Um, and I think you know. I'm a professional, so I'm used to this. I can only imagine what it's like for recreationals having to go through the same experience. They must have a lot of negative associations now um, with all the disconnections. But it is quite funny to see their their um, their ambassador actually getting uh, getting <laughs> tilted about disconnections as well, given given how many of them there are in GG. You know, it'd be a nice clip, right? And see, I think about stuff crazy now. Like, you know, Thomas does a lot of the editing, and he's got like a very cutthroat editing style i also have a cutthroat editing style i just never do it but i always like brainstorm ideas sometimes like what would i do if i was thomas right now and i was gonna meet him we're gonna have a call and we're gonna discuss some ideas here how would i edit this like thomas might edit this and um there's always these ideas that come up i mean negrano just gives like the greatest audio clips you can put with anything i put him on a plo hand the other day i lost like you could be disconnecting on gg put the disconnection noise up there where you're punching i mean there's just like so many like <laughs> kind of memes that you can create out of this guy like he's just like a meme city man i don't know i'm kind of liking the guy more now that we're talking more about him i mean i'm not like i don't want to be friends i don't want to like hang out with the guy or like go you know go to the go tan with him and go work out or something like that but (laughs) (laughs) i don't mind like he's funny he's around i mean he's like fucking character dude is he like the best representation of poker well if he's not winning like you can't keep back if he's got to win like win something daniel if he wins, he can run around in the tank top and shorts all he wants. And that maybe that's what I'm going to start doing because I want to be a winner like Danny Negreanu. So, but what Tara said was super important because that's what happens with these terrible sites is that they disconnect and their software is so terrible sometimes that if you're us, like, you're like, yeah, whatever. But I remember like ACR was doing this shit and I was just stop playing them. Like, I didn't want to deal with it anymore. I just played Ignition and that was it. So... I think a lot of other people are like that too, where they only play these sites because they have no real other option in some ways. And 
if someone else, like I, guys, I think there's so much opportunity in poker. I know it's tough with the regulations and, and having to fight that battle. And, you know, maybe I, I, I'm not as sympathetic enough with operators who follow rules and follow legalities in that situation. But I just see the marketing efforts and the lack of ambassadors in poker. It's like we didn't develop anybody through an operator as an ambassador on like a, a, a massive level when these are the only companies that can really do that because they have money. So they spend money on collaborations. They spend money on giving you opportunity as the ambassador. So the operators have the marketing budgets to be able to do this and they just haven't chosen to do that. And that's left us now where it's like, we're sort of building up the new ambassadors, right? Like the YouTubers are coming up, the Twitch people are coming up, right? The content creators are coming up, a Twitter person are coming up, an Instagram person's coming up, all these different countries are coming up, but there really isn't anyone who took over for the Negranus, Helmuts, those guys, because no one was promoted or pushed to that level yep. in collaboration with each other. There's not, there's just all this fragmentation in all these communities right now that the vloggers just work, they just vlog, right? And then the Twitch streamers, they just Twitch. and podcasters we kind of have people on all the time a little bit right and the sites they don't they only work with their ambassadors and they, they don't really do a good job of that sometimes so i just think there's so much room for improvement in all the businesses in poker that i if peep someone does care about solving them there's there's a lot of potential but you need people that really care about poker to kind of identify these problems and say i'm willing to work on a solution for them on that note joey ingram what a guest Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. We were just we, done? I, we, we were just thinking to ourselves, you know, that this show has been an experiment in so many ways. And we've had some good episodes. We've had some episodes that have, you know, maybe hit some decent numbers by our standards, not by yours. Uh, you're the king of YouTube, obviously. But we thought we'd just uh, maybe, you know, uh, glom on to you a little bit now and uh, and hope to, you know, maybe steal some of your audience share away now by having you on the show. And it has Bless been it. an absolute treat. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, that's, that's, that's how the strategy works, right? It's like you, I mean, that's how I built my strategy in a lot of ways was I was first had people I knew on, which was online poker players. I had my friends on that also played high stakes. So then I said, well, if I want to expand my audience, I probably need to find people that aren't, aren't PLO players, right? If I want to get more people into PLO, I need to find Nolan and Holden players, tournament players, live players. I need to find new friends and new people I want to work with, new people I want to talk to. So then I started expanding my audience out that way. And then I just you know, I kind of, I kind of stopped expanding it. And once I found like my regular people like Doug and, and those kind of guys, which is, it was easier, my friends. So I could certainly be more ambitious on that whole front. I, I, I use a pretty safe strategy on the podcast just because it's always worked out. But listen, if I need to evolve the podcast strategy, I already have the next three formats down. I'm just ready to unleash them boys. So I'm ready, but I think you guys are doing great, man. You guys are doing better on YouTube. You guys are uh, doing some of those hand histories. I think that are doing well. I mean, I think you guys provide a really, really, I tell you this all the time when I talk, you know, I talk to David a little bit more in Dara, but Dara, 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 how do you say it to Dara or Dara? Dara. Dara. Okay. Dara. Sorry. But I talked to David. I say, I think you guys are providing a really good service for the industry because you do really high quality interviews. You're very well researched on your topics. You're very consistent as well too. You know, a lot of people. So I think what you guys are doing is really cool and really good. You guys have guests on that don't necessarily get a, a well-educated platform when they do maybe content and you guys make them look real good with your research and with the questions that you can ask. So it's, yeah, I think there's a lot of things you guys are doing pretty well. So I think you guys are on a good track, man. Darius, you want to get in on this circle jerk? Yeah, no, no, you're brilliant. No, no, you're brilliant. <laughs> yeah, no, you're both brilliant. Yeah, it's, no, it's very nice to hear that from Joey. Um, I remember, I mean, Joey, I, I, I remember when I started listening to podcasts, um, jo Joey was the, uh, the po the voice I heard the most often, let's say, when I was doing my long runs in the park. Um, that's awesome. Uh, always, al always been an amazing interviewer. I think that's Joey's really big talent, getting people to talk, um, which is a lot more difficult than people think. Uh, I think a lot of people try it and then find out it's actually a lot harder than you think. Joey's interviews always sound like a natural conversation, which is the best um, the best compliment I could pay to any interviewer. Yeah, thank you. That's it. Got I trained that from talking with girls back in the day when I was, when I was 18 years old. I realized I thought about this a lot. I said, Where did that come from? And I used to have these like epic four hour, five hour phone calls with girls I liked. And I always knew that's what I was good at. I was just good at talking. Like I just would ask questions. I like to listen. I'm a very curious person. Like you guys say something, I'm like, Oh, tell me more. Like I'm, I just like to hear cool shit or interesting things. I like talking about the things I like. And you guys are all like, apparently, 
are into the same things I'm into, which certainly, you know, my girlfriend's not into that. But uh, so it's always fun to talk with people. I just like talking to people that are interested in the things I'm interested in, learning new things. So I think I just treat it like a conversation. When I treat it like an interview, it's, it's, it's not quite as good, I think, because it's, you know, less flowy, more like a forced topic sort of thing like that. So it may, maybe isn't the same. Well, I think you do a pretty good job uh, on that note. Joe Ingram, mm -hmm. thank you so much. All right, boys, take care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joey.